you're able to download the movies and watch them and download the notes. The notes are just text files, so you shouldn't have a problem there. Okay, going into our studio, uh, type in that library and in parentheses put uh, SFR. I want to see what happens. Library SFR in parentheses. What does it say? You notice I didn't get that. So I wanted to tell you, um, if you go to the, if you go to the course syllabus, Get it, of course, all of us. You'll notice there's a new link on your syllabus saying statistics for research package. Now, I've installed it. <clears throat> locally, but it's not install, installed globally yet. I would need to get Steve Beesler to do that. So if you click on that, if you click on that, it should download it. Okay. Then you can put it someplace convenient, like on your desktop. I've already done it, so I'm not going to do it again. Now you notice that that package, um, it actually ends in tar.gz. The tar, tar actually stands for tape archive, it's back in the days where it used to use magnetic tapes. But it's an archive where you take a folder, but it's also, it's also gzipped. So it's a zipped folder. If you actually look at where I'm developing this package, which is in Dropbox. Um, it's right here. So this is the folder I actually, um, this is actually the folder that has the package we're developing. Now later on in this course, no, no, not this course, I'm mixed up. In the next course, in the Stat 523, we actually show you how to create a package. In this case, well, the only thing I did here <clears throat> was I ran um, I ran an R command which created a <clears throat> it, cre it actually created a package but it comes out in the format tar.gz so how do you get it into your system if you wanted to actually install a package how do you do that in RStudio <clears throat> let me Let me get another, let me go back to our studio. I'll blow it up the full screen. If you look under, if you look under tools, you'll see that there's something that says install packages. So if you say install packages, there are two choices. You can install either a .toy.gz, which is what we have, which means it's something you created, or um, you can actually go to an archive and install them. Well, in this case, 
if you do this, if you browse, um, if you browse, oh, uh, this is a problem. Yeah. Before you do this, you need to do one other thing. You need to upload this file. So if you have a directory called stat512 or whatever it is, you can actually, first of all, you need to upload it. So wherever you are, you might want to go to the directory that you're interested in. In my case, it's under courses. And for the courses, um, it's stat512. So let's say you want to upload it. So I could then go. Now, by the way, I'm in this bottom I'm in, in my case, I'm in the one that says files. So of these quadrants, I'm in the one that says files. Wherever you have that may not be equivalent to me. And then you, um, you would say upload, and it says, well, okay, what do you want to upload? Where is it? So you can choose a file. So it's going to my desktop, which is where it is. So I click on this, and I say choose. You're probably accustomed to doing this if you use mix and you attach things a similar type of dialogue that you get. And then you say OK. And then notice that notice that it has uploaded it right here. Can everyone do that? I mean, first of all, you have to download it from the web page somewhere. Then you go into the quadrant that has files in it. And you just say upload, you locate it back on your local drive and you upload it. Put it somewhere that's reasonable. And then at this point, we can go into tools and install packages. And now, if you browse, um, in my case, it's under courses, it's under stat 512, and there it is. And so I could select it and I could open it. And now notice that my part package archive is here. So here's, I'm doing it as a part pack. This says I'm doing it as a package archive. Here it is. And I'm going to install it. By default, it should have your account. Does it? Notice that in my case, it's jhana or etc. So it's going to install it locally under your name. And this is true of all our packages. Even if you're using a, you know, a Mac or Windows, you have a choice of whether you install it. In other words, these are multi-user systems, so you have a choice of whether you're going to install it under your account or you install it at the system level. So if you have a laptop and several people have an account on it, you put it in your account, the other people don't have access to it. And if you put it globally, then everyone has access to it. That's the same thing here. I had installed it locally. But you didn't have access to it. That's because it was only installed in my account. So what you need to do is actually install. So click install and see what happens. I'm assuming that, you know, I'm assuming that um, it's you have something like that, except that your name is here, not mine. Is that correct? Is that correct? So uh, that being the case, did you successfully install it? You should have gotten stuff over here. I'm telling you what happened. Did anyone yeah. do it? Did it work? Yeah. Why not? The last done. It says done. Now type that command in again. Type the library command in again. Now, I will put this up for you. Generally speaking, I don't want you to have to do this. There's only one little problem, is that I'm going to be adding to this package throughout the course. And therefore, uh, installing it once at the global level isn't going to cut it. I'll have to install it periodically. But there may be cases where I say, OK, I don't have it installed globally. You need to install it locally. And you can reinstall it with updates on it. So if you installed it and you typed library, did you now get an error message? 
It worked. I need some feedback here. You I got any? Why not? I got errors installed. Okay. Did some of you get it to work? No, it didn't. They give me clean. Yeah, it, it worked. Okay, I'm not sure what happened in your case. Um, did you have all the dialogues correct? I'll have to look at it um, later. Okay, so that's the procedure. If you develop your own package, which some of you may do, there are many thousands of packages, so there are obviously a lot of people who have done this. CRAN itself has three or 4,000, but there are many that are not on CRAN, like this one. Of course, this package is only in development. So that's how you install a package into our studio. And so I'll let you know if I update it, and you can, if I update the package and say, okay, there's a new version of the package, it will, it will be on that main syllabus page, a new version, and you just click it, download it again, and upload it, and install it. As I said, I may not always have a chance to install the global one. Are there any questions on that? Okay, it's good to know how to do that. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go into the notes now. Um, and I'm going to be looking at chapter 3 today. Um, last time, so by the way, if you look at the class schedule, the chapter 3 notes are there. I believe I put them up over the weekend. So if you want those notes, you need to do the same thing. You need, it's the same procedure, except if I do this, it may it may not, depending on the browser, it may just show up here, so you may need to hold the option key down, and in this case, once I had the option key down, then in the downloads folder on a Mac, um, there are the notes. So again, depending on the system you're using, it will download someplace. You have to kind of know where that place is. On the Mac, it's in a folder called downloads. That's usually in the dock. So I downloaded the notes here. And then what you need to do is you need to do the same thing wherever you're putting the notes. So here I am in here I am in chapter 3 within my notes for 512. And so if I say upload, I can choose the file and in this case <clears throat> It's in the downloads. I would, I would choose it, and then I would say OK. I'm not going to do it because I already have, but I would say OK, and then I would uh, upload it. Is that clear how to do that? That's how you get it to the server. Now, if you're using your local machine, obviously you don't need to upload it. You know, you can just drag it wherever you're keeping this st stuff for 512. So is that clear? Yes. Uh, so how would you download it properly again from something like that? Hold the option key. See, by default, it's going to open it right there. So if you hold the option key, it actually downloads it. Is that working? You should see it's trying to sort of jump out and come down into the downloads folder. Well, at any rate, look look at the bottom in the downloads folder, which should be on the far right, beside the trash can, maybe, or someplace near there. So here's the downloads folder. And so it's... Is it working now? Well, I can't see the... 
Does it work for any of you holding down the option key? Do I have my computer set differently than me? I don't, that's the problem. I don't know exactly how these computers work for me. Yeah, holding the option key? Yeah. They should all be set the same way. Hold it first. Put option key, hold, then click. Is anyone else having trouble? Who's getting it? Raise your hand. Okay. So if you're not getting it, uh, maybe I need to talk to you after class. Unfortunately, I only have 10 minutes. You can actually um, cut and paste it if you would want to. There are, way, there are other ways to get it. So, so if you have your notes, then you can go to the, go wherever that is in the files menu, and if you click on it, I want you to bring it up into our studio. And so those are the those are the notes in chapter three. Now we talked about chapter three briefly, looking at the text, but I've redone these a bit. So if you've downloaded it over the weekend, I think this is a new version. Well, maybe not for this. There may be some changes in it. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, right now, just to show you what happens, I'm going to knit HTML. So I click on knit HTML, and it should go through and create <clears throat> this. Now, one of the things you kind of want to learn to do, there's not, <clears throat> excuse me, there's not very much of this that I that I need to do. That is to say, I'm putting some equations in, but for your homeworks, you're not going to need to do much of that. But it's a good idea to sort of see how that works. This is a binomial um, probability distribution. <clears throat> Now, at this point, I'm assuming this is a review. That is, you should know something about the binomial distribution. So <clears throat> if it is not that much of a review, then you should go back to chapter 3 and read this. In fact, if you look through those first seven chapters and you don't know the material, you should brush up. What's in the first seven, in fact, what's in the first eight or nine chapters should have been in Stat 511 or an equivalent course that you had. <clears throat> now, the notation may be slightly different, and that's perhaps another reason that you should go back and look at the material in the first chapters of this book. But basically, I'm saying I have a binomial experiment, and what that is, you have n trials, that are independent of one another. And each trial results in one of two outcomes, which we often call a success or a failure. The trials, as I said, are independent of one another. The probability of success is the same from trial to trial. And what we're interested in is the total number of successes, which we'll call y. y is a random variable. It's a random variable because if I conduct this experiment, you know, I may get a certain value of y, but if I conduct it again with the same n, same p, same conditions, I'll typically get another value of y. That is to say, we're dealing with probabilities, and so in advance we don't know what y is, and it will change from binomial experiment to binomial experiment. Each of the trials is called a Bernoulli trial. And the formula for computing this is n, the number of trials, things taking y at a time. In other words, if I want to know what is the probability of y equals little y. By the way, a random variable we denote by big Y. And the observed value we often say is little y. In other words, we say y equals y, but it's big y equals little y. <clears throat> or as little y is the observed value of the random variable big y. So... 
when we compute this, the way we can compute it, and the book has a lot of detail if you're uncertain about why this formula is what it is, it's n things taken y to times p to the y times 1 minus p to the n minus y. And that's true for y equals 0, 1, 2, up to n. I should probably add that. So y takes the, it's, just, it's what's called a discrete random variable, or a discrete probability mass function is what this is, which takes values 0, 1, up to 20. So the question is, is how do you compute these probabilities? Well, the book shows you how to compute them by hand. What I'm more interested in is, well, how do you compute them using R? So if you want to see and practice a little bit on doing it by hand, there are examples in the book you can look at. In fact, this example with blood pressure is done this way. <clears throat> so let's look at a, an example. Suppose um, you want to know what is the problem. Suppose you, um, you have blood types. Type O is one blood type. And suppose you want to know, or you assume at this point, that the probability that if you select a random individual, they have blood type O. Now, there are a lot of assumptions here that may or may not be true. In other words, the blood types, we don't know, well, I don't know, whether the blood types differ by race, for example. So when I say you randomly, let's assume they don't. So there's certain assumptions you really need to check out. Uh, what factors affect the blood type? But let's assume that we have um, a population. Let's assume that the blood types don't vary by race or gender or whatever. And let's assume that the probability of getting an O on a randomly selected individual is uh, 0.4. Is that what it is? 0.4, yeah. Right here. And so if, uh, if that's true, and I, if I just select and we're only going to, let's say we select four individuals. Uh, the reason you might, or the reason the book does this is because it actually calculates the probability by hand, and so you don't want n to be real large if you're going to do this by hand. But uh, on the other hand, a binomial experiment is almost always going to be a lot bigger than four. In which case, computing it by hand is not such a pleasant task, but R has no problems doing this. So if, the, if n equals 4 and p equals 0.4, then what is the probability of getting a 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4? Well, there's a function. And let me, let me leave, let me go back here. I'm going to compute some. One of the nice things about doing this, this is actually, uh, let me do one thing. I'm going to set the working directory to chapter 3, which is where I am. Now, if I go down here, I would like to mention that this is our markdown. And notice that I use equal signs up here, which is a head of one. I use dashes here, which is a head of two. I use three hash marks there, which is a head of three. And if you had four, it would be a head of four. And that was just notation. Now notice the actual, uh, this actually is the equation in LaTeX. And so LaTeX. A lot of it's sort of readable, right? The probability y equals y semicolon. And what that means is n and p are the parameters. Is equal to b for binomial of y, again, n and p. And then um, there, is, uh, there is a, there is a, if a backslash precedes something, then you're saying that this is a built-in for LaTeX. And in this case, it's, I'll show you what it gives, but I give two arguments for that, n and, n and, n and uh, curly braces and y. And if I do that, it's going to actually generate, oops, it's actually going to generate um, this part right here. No, the first part. And that means n things taken one at a time. So if I say four things taken at two at a time, how is that defined? Four things taken two at a time. Well, it's four factorial over 
y and n minus y, so it's 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 factorial, right? So, again, you can review this in the book if you're uncertain about it. And then the notation p to the y use the caret to represent a, 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 a superscript, use the underscore to represent a subscript, which we haven't done here, but an underscore represents a subscript, a superscript. Now, in this case, I put it in curly braces, but technically I wouldn't have had to put that in curly braces because it's a single symbol. But if you have more than one symbol, like where I have, one, I, if I have one minus p and then a caret, I have n minus y, that would have to be in curly braces. So I went ahead and put them both in curly braces. And when I execute that file, I keep doing this, and it's in a tab, I get this expression. And so you can take a look at that. Again, um, you can gradually learn uh, to do a few mathematical expressions. Um, but again, we're not going to require a lot of that in this course. Uh, I, you may also notice that that is what's called a displayed equation. By a displayed equation, I mean it doesn't appear in line. It appears on a separate line. So you can see for a displayed equation, as contrast to this right here, uh, where I have when y is the observed number of successes, and by putting dollar signs on each sign, then that's saying that's an inline mathematical expression. In other words, y is a mathematical expression. Now what LaTeX does is it italicizes it. You could have gotten it by using asterisks on each side, You'd, but uh, again, um, I was using the mathematical expressions. And I also did the same thing with n and p. n and p are the parameters, although you know n, you don't know p typically. So, if you look at the um, if you look at the text, if you look carefully, you can see um, you can see that p, n, and y are italicized. Now let's take a look at this experiment. And what I'm going to do is what I'm going to do is go back and I'm going to actually execute this right here. So if I, I have a block of R code and the three back ticks and then in curly braces I say R and that says, okay, this is going to be a block of R code that you're going to execute. And I name it. You don't have to name it, but I named it uh, binom blood because it's a blood sample that's binomial. So I named it binom broad. Now I could then refer to this chunk of code in another chunk of code by naming it. In other words, I have a label. And so therefore I could reference this elsewhere. Now if I just click right here on this statement and I click run, it actually just executes that statement. So if I wanted to show you, okay, let's look at why, what is why. Um, and I've got to be careful because I'll if I click on Y, or I type Y, well, those are the values, those are the binomial probabilities. I said D binom, that computes the densities, so D stands for density, or in this case, it's actually a mass function because we have a discrete distribution. And the 0 to 4 says, I want this for 0. What does 0 colon 4 mean? Well, let's see. If you don't know, try it. So if I say 0, <coughs> zero colon 4, that's actually a vector that goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I put that as the first argument, it gets expanded out. It's going to actually compute the binomial probabilities for 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And in fact, that's what it did. The second argument is n, which is the second argument, c, is 4. That's n. And the third argument is 0 0.4. That's the probability p. So this is the, these are the answers. Um, and so... What might you want to do? Well, I might want to put some descriptive names. So I, I have a simple, this is, a, y is now a simple vector. 
but it has no particular attributes. So I'm going to add an attri a name attribute to it. And so um, let, me ex let me execute this. So I'll execute. Now at this point, at this point I've simply said um, the names are for, for or p of y equals 0, p of y equals 1, up to p of y equals 4. So I'm going to actually call the names. Now what happens now if I, if I do that, and now I'll simply type in y, you notice that it, you notice how they differ. We have now named the elements so that you can read it better. So if you look at the actual output where I ran the whole thing, um, at this point, I didn't actually print that out, although I do a little bit later on. Uh, but that's sort of what you can do if you want to make it more descriptive. Now the next thing I'm going to do is plot this. So I'm going to plot this command, and when I do this, it simply uh, plotted this. And specifically, I told it to do a couple things. I said that type equals h, that means it's a line plot as opposed to it looks like a histogram. So by saying I want to plot, first of all, I have to tell at the x and y axis, well, the x and y axis, the x axis is 0 to colon 4, meaning 0 and 2, 3, 4. So that's the x axis. And what is the y axis? Well, the y, y axis is the values of y. In other words, I'm plotting y on the y-axis, and it automatically determined the scale. In other words, it made this scale big enough so that the maximum value doesn't exceed the top scale value. That was sort of done for you. H means it's a line plot. The line width is 3, so I made these lines a bit thicker so you can see them better. You notice they're actually thicker than the surrounding triangle. And then I have x lab, that means the x, um, the x label and the y label, or x lab and y lab. The x label is y, and that's what this y is, and the y label is p of y. Now, one of the things you can do is you can actually put mathematical expressions in LaTeX as part of your labels or in the graph. So, in other words, I can make very sophisticated graphs by using LaTeX or a version of LaTeX that I actually can embed in the text of the graph or on the axes. So this means that you can customize your graphs almost indefinitely. And if you actually look at plot, if you do the help for plot, then there's actually a lot more than you can do. So, you know, if you type in plot, if you're never sure of something, just type it in. And, and so this gives you the arguments. For example, these are the types of graphs, and I did H for a high density vertical line, so I did, um, I used H. But there are many different options for the type of graph that you might want to do if you want to plot points or lines or both, whatever. Certain types of graphs, plot is what's called a generic function. And depending upon the object you try to pl plot, there are certain assumptions that are made about what you want to do. So if x and y are numeric continuous variables, and you say, I want to plot x and y, it plots a scatter diagram or a scatter plot. So again, this is what you should do when you're uncertain of, um, when you're uncertain of what the arguments mean. Uh, you can, the first place you can look is, in fact, uh, using the help. I'll go back to plot. Are there any questions so far? Now, I'm always illustrating this for the binomial, but this type of thing you could also do for the normal or the chi-square or the Poisson distribution. Any of these distributions, you can do a similar type of thing. I'll probably later on at some point fill in some text of how you do this with a normal distribution because that's extremely important. <clears throat> so, 
Um, I'm going to go down here again. Uh, suppose we even want a more descriptive type name for Y. So I could actually redo the names. And so if I run that again, and in this case there were two lines, so I'm going to finish that line. And so those are the names. Um, again, when I type Y, the names have now changed. And so this gives the notation. It, again, I'm just using different names for the same thing. Instead of saying P of Y equals 1 and so forth, I'm actually giving it in terms of the binomial notation. So this is binomial 0, 4, and point 0.4, binomial 1, 4, and point 0.4, and so forth. So this, this actually means that y equals 0 for binomial distribution with n equals 4 and p equals 0.4. So it's a little more descriptive than what I did up here. Any questions? So when we look at the... Um, well, by the way, this is the plot if you, when you actually run everything, this is what the plot appears here. And then below this, this is what I just did. And I did want to point out one thing, that when I say names, and then I said y, um, notice that it gives the output, and it starts it out with two hashes. In other words, it starts the out, that means this is output, this is input, this is output. So you can, you, you can denote, you can see that. Also, these are actually different colors, but it's a little bit hard to see that um, projected up here. This is a little bit darker than this. So, so um, that's one example. And we didn't make any inferences about this, but what I'd like to now do is make an inference about uh, binomial distribution. So, um, if you were a dairy farmer and you um, were breeding cattle, you actually um, want a lot more, um, you actually want a lot more female cows than you want male cows. Why? Yeah, the, if you're a dairy farmer, the females produce the milk, and one bull can inseminate many females, so you don't need you don't want 50-50. So the question is, is can you control that? And it turns out that a mild acid may in fact tilt it towards, towards a female cows. And um, so if we do that, and so the idea is that you treat the semen of the bull with a mild acid and use artificial insemination. And then the idea is, is that hopefully you'll get a higher proportion of females than males. So suppose we want to test a hypothesis that mu, that, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, p, the binomial probability, is 0.5. And for this case, I'm going to assume a two-sided alternative, although realistically, uh, you'd probably want to say p is greater than 0.5. Is, if p is the probability of success, meaning a female, then uh, you probably would want a one-sided. But I'm going to go ahead and do a two-sided here, and I'll show you how to do a one-sided in a moment. So how do we... Now, suppose that we we artificially inseminate uh, and we get 20 calves. So we do this, and we get 20 calves. And suppose, in fact, um, suppose, in fact, that there are... Suppose there are actually 14, then the question might be, well, is 4 great enough that you would say it's not 0.5? What would you expect to get? So if, if the null hypothesis is really true, how many, how many female calves would you expect to get? Is that 10? Not 7. N is 20. P is 0.5 under the null. 10. N times P. The expected value of the random variable is Y is N times P. Right? The variance of Y is N times P times 1 minus P. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, of course. But you'd expect about 10. So if you got 14, 
Is that evidence that, in fact, you reject the null? That it's far enough away that you reject the null? Well, how do we compute this in R? Well, uh, if you were doing a formal test, you would say, okay, I'm going to choose a significance level of 0.05, let's say, and then I'm going to have a rejection region. In this case, I'm going to reject for small values of y and large values of y if it's two-sided. In other words, if y is too large, that indicates p is greater than 0.5. If y is small, that indicates that p is less than 0.5. Does that make sense? So under the null, I want to pick a rejection region. And by the way, the binomial distribution is typically not symmetric. It's skewed. If p is greater than 0.5, it's skewed positively. And if p is less than 0.5, it's skewed negatively. But at p equal 0.5, the binomial distribution is symmetric. So what I want to do is find some values of y on the high end that give about 0.025. And I want to find some values on the low end that give about 0.025. And the question is, is, well, what are those values? In other words, if I'm greater than or equal to this or less than or equal to another thing, then I want the probability of that total together being 0.05. So, so let's, let's go back here and take a look at this for a moment. And so if I... If I were computing let's suppose let me redo this. I'm gonna cut and paste this over here. I'm gonna cut and paste this. And here I want here I want zero to twenty. And here I want twenty. And here I want 0.5. So this says I want to compute the binomial probabilities for 0, 1, 2, up to 20. And I want to do this for n equals 20 and p equals 0.5. Do you see what I just did? This is a nice thing about R. It lets you kind of experiment like this. And I'm actually, so I don't destroy that y, I'll call this y1. And so what are the values of y1? Well, those are the probabilities going from 0 up to 20. Now, notice 10 is a 0.16 or something like this. This is 9. How do I know that? Well, this tells me this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then number 6 starts the second row. And then the last one in the second row is 10. And then the first one and the third row is 11. So those numbers on the left are telling you what the va what no you know how far you are into your vector um, for each row. Where, what's the starting position? So those are the probabilities. And so what you might now want to do is actually plot these. So let's let's plot these. But now I've got to change this from 0 to 20. And then I need to put y1 here just to change it. And I think that's the only thing else I have to change. And so now if we compute it, this is the problem. This is the distribution under the null distribution. And so what I want to do is look at the probabilities on the high end and on the low end, such that those probabilities add up to about 0.05 if my significance level is preset to 0.05. Now, will it be exactly 0.05? Can you find values of y that add up so that the probabilities add up to 0.05? Probably not. We have a discrete distribution. If you had a continuous distribution, like we'll do in Chapter 8, you could get them to add up to 0.05. You could find the critical values such that they add up. In this case, no. So I need to find a rejection region for the large values of y and the small values of y. So let us go back. Let us go back and look. And <clears throat> so how do I compute the low values? Well, let's just try. I'd like each, the lower and the upper values, to be about 0.025. And so 
I use the P binome, P B I N O M. Computes computes what? It computes the actual probabilities. In this case, it computes the cumulative probabilities. So if I want the probability that y is less than or equal, look at the green. If I want the probability that y is less than or equal to five, I can do that using p binome. And notice I want it for 0.5 when it equals 20. And so the arguments are five. The first argument is five. That says I want the probability of less than or equal to five. And then the second argument is 20. That's n. And the third argument is p. Under the null distribution, we compute this. It's 0 0.05. And if I compute this, it's 0 0.02069. Now, what would happen if I'd say, oh, well, maybe I can squeeze 6 in there. Well, if you put 6 in there, the, the, the value is greater than 0 0.025. So I don't want to put 6 in there. Now, I also have to compute the upper probabilities. So how do I compute the upper probabilities? Notice that I say 14, 20, 0 0.5. And I'm going to try sort of the symmetric. If I was getting y less than or equal to 5, I'm going to try y greater than or equal to 15. And so because it's a symmetric distribution, I'm going to try to divide it equally. So if I'm 5 below 10, I want to go 5 above 10. Does that make sense? So um, on the low side, I was trying less than or equal to 5. And on the high side, I'm going to try greater than or equal to 15. However, uh, in order to get, because that prop, the p binome always computes less than or equal. And so what I have to say is lower tail equals false. By default, it computes the lower tail, less than or equal. But I want greater than or equal. So I say lower tail equals false. But there's one little problem here. It's still computing less than or equal. So instead of saying 15, I have to say 14 to get 15 or above. In other words, to get 14 above, I have to put as my first argument 14. I know that's a little. But by putting 14, that's actually going to, and I'm, and I'm going the upper tail by saying lower tail equals false, I'm actually getting 15 or above. So if I do that, notice I get the exact same answer, 0.02. Uh, z uh, 0, 6, 9. So I have symmetry on the lower and upper tail. So my rejection region will be y less than or equal to 5 or y greater than or equal to 15. So if I in fact got 14, what is my conclusion? Accept. Yeah, I, ex I accept the null or I don't reject it at least. I fail to reject the null because I'm not in the rejection region. Just missed it. Okay, so here I put, I put lower plus upper is actually 0 0.04. Now, in reality, I'm even closer than that in a way because I'm really, my significance level isn't 0.05. It's really about 0 0.04, if you see what I'm saying. So, but I'm in the, if, if in fact, um, if in fact I use 0 0.05 or less, then I get an acceptance region. I, I fall in the acceptance region, and I do not reject. But the way we usually do things, and the way that computer output is almost always given, is in terms of the p-value. The p-value is the probability I get something as extreme or more extreme than the observed test statistic, given that the null is true. Well, if I got 14, if I got 14, then what is the p-value for this? Well, so look at the uh, code. If you actually, by the way, you can play with these back here. If you go down to the dairy farmer example, um, you can actually, let me do this because it does illustrate one thing. When I did this, when I did look at this versus look at y1 when I created it, y1 did not automatically print. I had to actually, on the next line, say y1 to get it to print, right? In other words, I assigned y1 the values, or the vector in this case, by doing d binome, a 
applying that function to some arguments. But it didn't print. But I then on the next line said y1 and it printed. So why did this one print? Because I'm assigning the p binom with its arguments to lower. Why did it print? It's because I surrounded it by parentheses, which forces it, it sort of saves a step. By putting the parentheses, it actually forces it to print. So that's, you know, if you step through each of these, and I can do this over here, and then lower plus upper, but now I'm interested in, you know, I'm interested in um, the p-value, and as I mentioned to you, the expected value is 10, and if we get 14, this is where we say if y is 14, we're looking over here, here excuse me, where someplace I say y is 14, where is it? Right here, where I say y is 14. The question is, how extreme is it? And the p-value computes the probability of how extreme it is. Is it just 14 or above? Well, it would be if it was one-sided, but it's not one-sided. So it's either 14 above or 6 or less. 14 is 4 above 10. 6 is 4 below 10. So when I'm talking about extremeness here, I want to know what is the probability it's 14 or above or 6 or less. So I'm computing that. And I'm actually doing this in one statement now. And let me go back and look at this statement. So the first expression, the first expression says p binome 6, 20, 0 0.5. That's the probability of y is less than or equal to 6. And then I say plus p binome. And notice I have 13, and I say lower tail equals false, so I'm getting the upper tail. Why do I have 13? Because 13 is really 14 or above. So the p-value, if, if I actually execute this, you can see that the p-value, and that printed out because I didn't assign it. I didn't assign it to anything. I just gave an expression, an expression evaluates, and it gets printed out automatically. And so, going back here, that was when I ran the whole thing as a complete script, I can see that the p-value is 0.11. And say, so in other words, I would not even have rejected at alpha equals 0.1. Even though we're, it looks like we're fairly close to the rejection region, the p-value still is greater than 0.1, and it's definitely greater than 0.05. So again, I fail to reject the null. Now, part of the problem is, is that I have a small sample size. It's, it's possible that, in fact, the acid treatment is effective, but we have too small of a sample, and therefore we don't have enough power. Now, I'm going to compute the power in a second, but for an, maybe I should do it for this one too, but I haven't done that yet. I should maybe include this. But the point is, is that um, if, in fact, if, in fact, it increased the probability to 0.6, in other words, if the real probability with the acid is 0.6 instead of 0.5, would you detect the 0.6? As a researcher, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I want to detect? You know, do I want to detect 0 0.6, 0 0.7? What do I want to detect? And you can compute the power. You had a question? Uh, why don't you zoom its continuous distribution and carefully like 14.3 or, I mean, finding that one and... Yeah, in change. other words, if I use a normal approximation yeah. to the... Yeah. Zoom is continuous, finding that... Yeah, well, I could do a normal uh, approximation to the binomial, and that, that's actually talked about in the book in Chapter 7. Um, I, I could actually approximate the binomial by a normal, and I could actually just do, you know, a z-test or... Um, or in this case, it would be a z-test. 
So I could do a Z test or a normal test, uh, except uh, the question is, is how good of an approximation is it? Well, under the null, if you actually look here, under the null, you can see the normal would actually approximate this pretty well. Uh, that's because p equals 0.5. Now, n is not that large, and usually we want n to be a little bit bigger than 20 before we use the normal approximation. But when p is 0.5, you can see the normal approximation is actually, you see that actually looks pretty much like a bell-shaped curve, right? So the normal approximation probably would be okay here. But ordinarily, you'd want more n to be more like 30 before you start kicking that in. Um, if, if, in fact, I were testing the hypothesis that p equals 0.2, or p equals 0.8 or something, then the binomial is skewed and the normal approximation may not be so good for n equals 20. Does that make sense for you? If you have a skewed distribution, so if a binomial has p equals small or low, you have a skewed distribution, and then you don't you have to get a bigger n to get a better approximation. But we could actually super, this is a nice thing about R, I could actually superimpose a normal curve on that using the variance of this binomial distribution, using the mean and the variance. We could see exactly how close it is. Um, I actually did that in chapter one, if you look at the notes, where I superimpose it on a histogram. Well, you could also do it here. You could superimpose a normal curve on this. That's the nice thing about R. You know, you kind of never stumped. I wouldn't say never, but almost never. It, you know, you can do almost anything. So I can see how close this normal approximation is. And at some point when I write the code that deals with chapter seven, you know, I could show you how that works. Okay, well then what about the power? Well, um, Let's take, let's take another, I, I probably should do that for that example too, but I, I don't want to take the time right now to do it. But let's look at uh, another example. Now there are certain people that, um, uh, this is more from psychology, and this deals with children that have a read reading problem. And some people, when they see, they reverse letters. So if you see the word saw, S-A-W, you may read it as, as was. So you reverse the W and the S. And um, so it's claimed that uh, more than 70% of the children doing this are boys, that it's more prevalent among boys than it is among girls. And so if you would um, say sample 20, and you could test this hypothesis that P equals 0.7, and maybe you want to know, you want to know one sided here that the probability P greater than 0.7 is the is the alternative. Then you could actually run run this. Um, but uh, I don't actually have the code there. That's actually similar to the example I I just did. Um, I I actually I actually wanted to sort of compute the power to do a power calculation to say this. Okay, if I wanted to detect the, if I wanted the probability to be high that I detect 0.75, now if the null is 0.7 and I want to detect 0.75, you might guess that you have to have a pretty large sample size. Does that make sense? I mean, if it was 0.7 and I say, well, what's the probability I can detect 0.9? Well, you wouldn't need such a large sample size to detect a 0.9 if the null is 0.7. But how, how, what will we have to do to get reasonable sample sizes if, in fact, the, we want to detect 0.75? In other words, I want, I want to be able to detect a very small difference or a pretty small difference. Well, it turns out that you need about 500. And, you know, this may not be feasible in a study to do this, but I'm just pointing out that if you, in fact, wanted um, if you want to detect 0.95, then you would need um, you would need to, and let's for the sake of argument say we're going to use 501. Okay. Now, um, 
under the null distribution, what is the rejection region? If you had n equals 501, and this is a pretty large sample, and in this case, even though we have a, even though we have a, um, a binomial distribution here, do you think we could use a normal distribution with n equals 501, even though p is 0.7 and therefore the binomial distribution is skewed? The answer is yes. We probably could, but in R, we can actually compute this exactly, even though N is big. That's no sweat for R. So we can compute it exactly. So what would be the rejection region if, in fact, um, you know, if, in fact, we want to, um, test this at the 0.05 level and it's one-sided. Well, the reason I did this was to illustrate the Q binome. The Q binome is the quantile, and what I want to do is if I want, if I want to say, what is, if I look at the probability that y is greater than or equal to y is 0.95, and I tell you 0.95, and I say, well, what's y? You follow me? In other words, I'm saying the probability that the random variable, the binomial random variable, is greater than or equal to y given the null is true, and I want that probability to be 0.95, what is y? Well, I can do that with the Q binome, and it turns out that it is equal to 367. So if I get 367 or above, that would be my rejection region. And now I'm going to ask the question, I'm now going to ask, I'm actually now going to ask, what is the significance level of this? Well, the significance level, I use P binome, and I want the probability of 367 or greater, and so I'm going to use a 366 with the lower tail equals true. And that tells me that the actual, the actual significance level is 0 0.06. Again, it's not exactly 0.05. There's one more thing I want to do, and that is I now want to compute the probability I'm, I'm in the rejection region given that p equals 0.75, and that is the power. Okay. So the power is the probability I'm in the rejection region when the alternative is true. And in this case, um, I want to compute that when p is 0.75. So, and that turns out to have a power of 0.83. So we have fairly high power for rejecting the null when, in fact, the null is false. And so that's what we want. So again, I was illustrating, doing this to illustrate Q stands for quantile. So when I say probability of big Y is greater than or equal to little y, little y is the quantile that in this case corresponds to point, 0.95. And I use p binome to actually compute the, the probability, which in this case, that's the significance level. And then notice here I say that 0.7 is my second argument, not my, sorry, my third argument. n equals 501 and p equals 0.7 is in fact um, the null. So that computes the significance level. But but the power, I'm using 0.75. Notice that the third argument is 0.75. So when I want to compute the power, I get it's 0.83. So I have fairly high power of computing. So again, you may want to review this material. Um, if, if I say the word power and you have no clue what I'm talking about, you probably need to go back and start reviewing some of the early sections. But the prob probability is the probability you reject the null when, in fact, you should. And so one aspect of experimental design is to determine the power. If you conduct an experiment and your power is very, very low, you might as well not conduct the experiment. It's bound to fail. So um, if, you're doing, if you write a grant, let's say, with NIH, or NSF, for that matter, or and you can't demonstrate that, you're, that your study has reasonable power, you will not get funded. 
So power studies almost always have to be done as part of the proposal for the grant that you put. You have enough money in your grant that you're going to be able to conduct these experiments and have a reasonable probability of detecting the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, if in fact the alternative is true. So power calculations are almost always done at the beginning of the study. They should always be done for any research project because uh, if you're you know, if you're doing a study, again, you're wasting your time. If you, if you don't have enough money to get a large enough sample size, you're wasting your time. So you have to have some idea what those sample sizes should be. Now let me just talk for a moment about estimation. And basically, basically uh, the question is, if I want to estimate P, how do I do it? Well, the estimate of p, which we call is p hat, which is simply y, the observed outcome over n. So when we look at this, we can see that y equals p hat is what is called the maximum, maximum likelihood estimator. And just to give you some examples, I'm going to look at three graphs. And the maximum likelihood estimator uh, is the most probable estimator, given your outcome. So if you have a certain outcome, you say, well, what is the most probable value? Well, just to show you how this might work, um, I just did a graph here. I'm doing three graphs here for uh, three different values of p. This is again a sample size of 20 for p equals 0.3, p equals uh, 0.5, and p equals 0.7. So I'm actually doing um, I'm actually doing three graphs. And notice that when p equals 0.3 and, and n equals 20, then y equals 6 is the most probable value. And in fact, so y equals 6 is the most probable value. That's in fact the mean. 0.3 times 20 is 6. So the mean, in fact, is the most probable value. And again, if I look here for 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times 20 is 10. And there, the y equals 10 is the most probable. And here, uh, y equals 14. That's 7. 0 0.7 times 20 is 14. So those are, you can see the skewness. That has some positive skewness. 0.5 is symmetric, and that has some negative skewness. Is that clear? Now, if you if you get p to be more extreme, 0.9 or 0.1, it's even more skewed. So that sort of gives you the idea. But I'm not going to get carried away in this course talking about the particular characteristics of the maximum likelihood estimators. Typically, uh, typically we will be using maximum likelihood estimators, or or we'll modify things. We'll take a maximum likelihood. We may modify it. So, for example, if uh, you know the formula for the sample variance, um, and you divide by n minus 1, you know the formula? We like the sum of the y squared minus the sum of the y over n divided by n minus 1, the whole thing. That's the variance. That's the variance. That's a bias estimator, right. And the maximum likelihood estimator that actually divides by n and the reason we divide by n minus 1 is to make it unbiased. So sometimes we modify the maximum likelihood estimator slightly to make it, say, unbiased. I'd like to do one more thing. There's, uh, we're gonna, we may do a little bit in this course on nonparametric statistics. And so when we're doing nonparametric statistics, um, one of the simple tests you might do is what's called a median test. And so let's suppose that, suppose you, um, an oncologist believes that a uh, particular cancer um, occurs with a median value um, of 49.5 years. So you may have a lot of data. And that, let's, let's suppose that um, this is actually cervical cancer. Now let's suppose that if, on the other hand, um, you want to know, well, what about, say, uterine cancer? Is that the same? So if you get a sample, and so if let's say in cervical cancer you have a lot of data and suggest that the median age of women who have it 
is 49.5. And you believe that, well, maybe that's, maybe that's the same, or maybe it's at least that for uterine cancer. And so you go out and collect a sample, and you want to test this hypothesis. Well, under the null hypothesis, uh, under the null hypothesis, um, you would, um, if the null hypothesis is true, you'd have a 50-50 chance, because it's the median, the median's at the 50th percentile, you'd have a 50% chance of being greater, 50% chance of being less. And that's not quite correct because of the discreteness of the distribution, if, if we consider age to be discrete. But it's approximately true that you'd expect about 50% to be above and 50% below. So under the null hypothesis, the probability I exceed, probability I exceed 49.5 is about 50%. So this, if I do an experiment, I could actually do this as a binomial test. And so I collect a bunch of women, I see when they have cervical cancer, I say, is it greater than 0.49.5 or not? And for each woman, it's either yes or no, so it becomes a binomial. So if I'm testing that the age is 49.5, I could do this uh, with a one-sample t-test, uh, which we will talk about in Chapter 8, which is actually the next thing we're going to talk about. Uh, but suppose you find out that 17 out of the 20 women, in fact, um, 17 out of the 20 women have an age of 49.5 or greater, or greater, let's say greater than 49.5. And if we were testing this, you might ask, well, uh, what is the probability, what is the p-value for this? Well, the p-value is the probability of getting 17 or above. Since it's one-sided, I only needed to look at the upper tail. Probability of 17 above, given the null hypothesis is true, which is given p equals 0.5, and I have to say lower tail is false, so I'm going to say 16, which means 17 or above, and you see that the p-value is 0.001288. So what does that mean? It's highly significant. So that indicates that women with cervical cancer are also likely to, to be at an older age. In other words, these are diseases that tend to much have a much higher probability, um, much higher probability for older, older women. So, are there any questions on that? And again, um, so I was actually computing uh, just using a binomial. I was computing a what's called the median test. That's a fairly common type test, and it was very easy to do with just one statement in R. Okay. Well, what I now want to do is I want to go to Chapter 8. So I'm going to go to my notes and Chapter 8, you may or may not have downloaded, but it's on the website. So I'm going to bring up Chapter 8. If you don't want to do it at this point, you don't need to. I'm not going to save this. Um, chapter 8 is on the t-test. So again, this is where I'm really starting the course. I may go back and talk about a few things in those first chapters, but I was partly talking about the binomial because the binomial is very common, and that comes up in logistic regression some of those types of models. For the most part, we're going to be, uh, or you might ask the question, well, what are we going to do? Let me show you, since I don't have this filled in, what the topics are, or at least partly what the topics are. So if you look at the book, If you look at the book, I'm going to chapter eight is really, you know, the, the focal point of where we're where we're starting, and so so we're going to be starting with the t distribution in chapter eight. So this will be talking about things like the one sample t test, the two sample t test. Uh, we're going to do everything in R, though. Uh, the parrot t-test, and then there's a non-parametric test we may do. And then um, the next thing we do is look at linear regression, which is relatively straightforward. But again, 
we're going to be now technically you should have had both of these topics so this is a review so I'm going to go through them pretty fast you should have had the t-test and you should have had the um, linear regression the simple linear regression in this case now the next thing we're going to do is the one-way analysis of variance but we're going to and that's in chapter 10 and then in chapter 11 we're going to bring in the concept of random effects and this gets into different types of models of what are called fixed and random effects so we're going to introduce some things as well as multiple comparisons in in chapter 11. Now in the book I've broken chapter 12 into two pieces here. Um, chapter 12 actually talks about two topics, experimental design and factorial experiments. And this is where the differences start really coming into play because the book has a philosophy that you should do everything by hand, which is not my philosophy. I think you should probably do everything by R. Um, and so therefore, if I do it by hand, I can't do very complex data sets. And the reality is you're never going to do them by hand anyway. The calculations are in the book for you to look at, but what I'm going to show is how to compute them by hand. Now, the other problem is, and I'm also going to distinguish between treatment design and experimental design. Treatment design is how the treatments are related to one another. And I'm specifically going to talk about nested and, and factorial designs. And factorial designs are when we have crossing of treatments with one another. And nested design is when we have one treatment nested with in another. Or perhaps it's due to, to the, the way we sample. So I'm actually going to break factorial designs out. And one of the things that I'm going to be looking at is unequal sample sizes. That is to say, if I have several factors and I'm trying to see the effect of factors A and B on the outcome variable, then what happens if I what happens if I don't have what's called a balanced factorial? And if you don't, then you're not going to compute it by hand, I will guarantee you. It, it, is very, it becomes very difficult to compute. So I'm going to show you how to do not only balanced type designs, even if you intend, even if you design things to be balanced, all of a sudden you have a missing value. So it's no longer balanced. So if it's no longer balanced because you have a missing value for some reason, there are two strategies you have. One is um, you, we can use these approaches based on unbalanced designs, or we can use statistical imputation. And imputation is a big topic. That is, you actually impute the value that's missing. Uh, we will only do that in a simple way. There are very sophisticated ways of, of imputing values. And then I'll get an experimental design. Experimental design is about controlling variation. So the idea is that if you run an experiment and you have too much noise, guess what? You can't detect the signal. So the question is, is how we can design experiments that reduce the noise so you can detect the signal. It reduces cost because if you've got too much noise in the system, and you can't reduce it, it, it def what it typically means is you have to have a very large sample size so that the signal, you can hear the signal, but you only hear it with large n. But if I can control the variation and reduce the variation, then, in fact, I can hear the signal you know, with a much smaller sample size, meaning much less money. So that's what experimental design is all about, and we'll get into different designs to do this. Then we get an analysis of covariance, which kind of combines the analysis of variance with regression. Now, we're going to do some simple topics um, in covariance where we don't get into complex models. The next chapter, which I actually don't have here, is multiple regression. And then the final component of the course is logistic regression. So that's sort of where we're going. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it's going to take to get there, which is part of the reason that I haven't filled in the schedule. Okay. What time is this class here? In any regard. 12.45, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Someone should have said something. Okay. So I uh, downloaded the notes for Chapter 8. We, we're going to go through these pretty quickly. We'll probably just spend, one, we'll probably just spend Thursday on that. Okay. Any questions? 
if you're having trouble, um, email me if you're having trouble or stop in if you're having trouble. Um, the next class starts, I guess, in three minutes. So email me if you're having trouble uploading files and so forth. You should make sure by Wednesday you're getting everything to work. Okay, thank you.